Welcome to today's Industry Expert Insights webinar powered by DerekDope.com. I'm Shane Gillespie, producer of this series, and I'll be your host today. Today's topic is Understanding 1031 Options and Solutions in Today's Market. Our presenters today are Derek Doak, Chief Investment Officer at Barclays Realty and Management Company, and Anna Marie Koenig, Northwest Division Manager at Asset Preservation Incorporated. Derek is currently the Chief Investment Officer, Designated Broker, and Senior Asset Manager for Barclays Realty and Management Company. His responsibilities include maintaining and creating value to ensure predictable returns, as well as identifying, evaluating, and executing on acquisition and disposition strategies. Prior to joining Barclays in 2010, Derek leveraged his experience gained while working as a director with Deloitte and Touche in real estate, wealth management, tax planning, and entrepreneurship to found the investment group Tamaris Properties LLC in 2001. Derek received his Bachelor of Science degree uh, in accounting from Central Washington University and a master's degree in real estate from Georgetown University. He is an active member of several trade associations including CCIM, CBA, FIABCI, AICPA, and the WSCPA. In addition, Derek is the incoming president of CCIM Washington State Chapter. Anna Marie has an extensive background in IRC 1031 tax deferred exchanges and every aspect of real estate transactions, having participated in thousands of closings during her many years of work in the title and escrow industry. She is currently the Northwest Division Manager for Asset Preservation Incorporated, a subsidiary of Stewart Title Company. They're a leading national IRC 1031 qualified intermediary that has successfully completed over 170,000 1031 exchanges across the nation. Anna Marie teaches a variety of clock hour CE and CLE classes for investors, attorneys, real estate brokers and agents, accountants, and financial advisors throughout the Northwest. Anna Maria is a regular instructor at all the major real estate associations throughout Washington and Oregon. In addition to completing her master level real estate finance courses at Portland State University, Anna Marie also holds a Bachelor of Business Administration Economics degree from Gonzaga University. Okay, Derek, I'm going to turn the presentation over to you um, for an overview of today's event. Perfect. Thanks, Shane. Appreciate that. And uh, good morning, Anna Marie and everybody out there listening. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the 1031 solutions and options. Uh, Anna Marie, as Shane has mentioned, has extensive experience in this, and so I'm excited to have her be a part of this presentation for you all to listen to. Um, expectations for today's presentation is really understanding the options for owners and investors when it comes to uh, investment properties, and especially when there's an appreciation of that property. Uh, why do an exchange, understanding why there is a need for it, uh, who owns the property during the exchange process, understanding the requirements for full deferral, uh, one requirement the IRS is really concerned about, which you'll learn, how to handle a partner or member uh, wishing to exit the LLC or partnership at the time of exchange, uh, why related parties matter, understanding replacement properties themselves, uh, what does a 1031 cost and have a a uh, firm and a group uh, like Anna Marie's to do that. And what about seller financing? That's always a big key as well. Also, we'll talk about maximizing the disposition. Once you understand what a 1031 is, now you want to understand how do I get the most for my assets so I can enjoy a 1031 and use a service like Anna Marie's. And then we'll have our conclusion and final comments. And so with that, don't want to hesitate. Let's get started. Anna Marie, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, Derek. Good morning, everyone. So today we're going to focus a little bit on what are the options for investors holding investment property. So what is investment property? Well, you we can think of it in three ways. Number one, it's rental income. Number two, it's land. And number three, it is commercial. So there are a number of different sections in the Internal Revenue Code that actually deal with real estate, and I'm going to highlight these briefly this morning for us. So the first one, obviously, is the 1031 section of the code, and this gives taxpayers holding property for investment purposes to potentially defer all four levels of taxation that would otherwise be incurred upon the sale of their investment property. And just so you know, 1031 exchanges have been a vital part of our tax code since 1921, so almost 100 years. 
The next section in, in the code that deals with real estate property is section 1033. Many of you know this is involuntary conversion or eminent domain. It has different rules and different time restriction. It is actually outside the 1031 world. So if someone has a property that has eminent domain or a public taking language, they do not need to use a 1031 exchange company for that. IRC section 121, many of you are familiar with it and just as many are not. This is the tax exclusion on the sale of a principal residence held for two out of five years. So a single filer may exclude uh, up to 250000 of taxable gain and married filing jointly would be able to exclude up to 500000 of taxable gain. Now, the footnote on this is that there will be some new proposed time requirements with a new uh, tax reform that's coming um, in a matter of days. But that is not inked yet, so we're not going to say what those are. Section 453 actually has to do with seller financing, and it's actually an accounting procedure. So if you have a client who does seller financing, they carry the note, then they'll be able to perform what is called installment sale treatment on their taxes. So um, it's an accounting procedure in the code. And then lastly, Section 721, and this is actually a tax deferral when a REIT, R-E-I-T, Real Estate Investment Trust, acquires a property and the investor will receive operating units. We refer to them as OP units in the REIT, and it is referred to as an up REIT transaction. So with this, when a REIT acquires one of your client's properties, they will not receive cash. They will, on the other hand, receive OP units, which will be shares in the REIT, and they are able to enjoy the diversified portfolio of that REIT. The last thing is hold seller exchange. What are the options for an investor who, wants, who has a highly appreciated property? What can they do? Well, number one, they can hold. They can hold the property and continue to pay down the debt. Maybe it appreciates. But what about the lost opportunity cost? Maybe they're in an area that doesn't have a lot of appreciation, but they're almost losing out on the ability to do a 1031 exchange and defer all their proceeds into a replacement property that has a lot more gain on the upside, maybe in appreciation, maybe in rental income, or both. The next thing, obviously a seller can go ahead and put their property on the market and sell it. Well, all right, they sell the property in 2017 or 2018, and they're going to pay all the taxes owed on that property. The question I present to all of you is, what can they do with those net after-tax proceeds? Will they have the same opportunity to reinvest those and have the return on investment as it, as, excuse me, versus using gross equity, meaning no taxes paid, and putting those in real estate for a greater return on investment? So there, there's an exchange of opportunities there. Lastly, the 1031 exchange, obviously you can defer all your capital gains with a fully deferred exchange or receive some boot through a partially deferred exchange. Now we're going to go on and cover uh, boot in, in a further slide, so we'll go on to the next. So let's talk about what the taxes the real estate investor faces. There are four levels. Number one, the first tax. Many people forget about this. It's called the depreciation recapture tax, the federal tax at 25%. So all the depreciation the investor has taken on that property, the total amount, if they sell, 
they will have their total depreciation amount taxed at 25%. Next, we have the capital gain tax at 15 or 20%. Now, the majority of investors are paying the 15%. 20% is for the high wage earners, so that would kick in when the investor has you know, reportable W-2 income or 1099 income of 400,000 plus for a single filer and 450,000 for married filing jointly. The third one came about in 2013 called the Net Investment Income Tax, finally referred to as NIT. It also has some other names like the Obamacare tax. That is 3.8%. Now, that net tax is on interest, dividends, rental income, capital gains. It will kick in for the investor when they have totals of $200,000 for a single filer and $250,000 plus for a married filing jointly. And then the last potential tax are the applicable state capital gain tax. Now, of course, in Washington, we only have the excise transfer tax. But, however, we have so many exchanges that are being originated out of California and are using their exchange proceeds for the replacement in Washington. You need to know why they're doing that. And in the state of California, the capital gains tax, as you can see here, is a range of 9.3 to 13.3%. So fairly, that 13.3 is the highest in the nation. And then, of course, south of us is the state of Oregon with their own state capital gain tax of 9.9%. So there's a lot of impetus for those investors coming out of states with capital gain tax to replace into Washington or other states. I don't have that. So why do an exchange? Well, there's a number of reasons. Your property has appreciated. Many real estate investors bought at the down, last downturn, excuse me, now have double or triple appreciation. So they need to move their product, right? They need to take advantage of that appreciation. That's why they want to do an exchange. But wait. Excuse me, there is a typo on this uh, slide. It's, it's not taught deferral, it is tax deferral. So add an X there. So one of the reasons why they do a 1031 exchange is to defer on all four levels of capital gain taxation that we just went over. Another reason is leverage. I mean, they own their investment property outright. They have no debt. Well, now they need to sell that. So that, they, so that they can use that equity as a down payment, take on some debt into a much larger performing property or properties. Many investors look to diversify, right? They can diversify in a 1031 exchange by asset class or geographically anywhere in the United States. This is one of the most confusing areas for potential exchangers in that they hear the words like kind, and they think, well, I have a multifamily apartment unit. I must do an exchange and use my replacement property as a multifamily apartment. Not so. It's any property held in a productive use in a trade or business or for investment. We also have depreciation. Many investors are staring down at the end of their property's depreciation life, and they really need to sell so that they can acquire a new depreciation schedule. And then we have management relief. So you, if the investor has multiple rental properties, perhaps they want to sell all of those in a multi-property exchange and purchase a small commercial type property. It's one of the sayings in the industry for management relief is that the investors are tired of the T's. And the T's are tenants, trash, the toilets, and the taxes. So they want some relief from that 
and maybe go into a single user property. And then last but not least is estate planning purposes. You know, we often find that we'll have investors who have a large commercial property and they want to sell and exchange into multiple properties of less value and designate each of those property for an heir. So going on, one of the things that the IRS is very concerned with is, is who owns the property, right? So who owns the property may be different from a federal perspective versus the local perspective, either by city or state. So in a 1031 exchange, the seller is determined by the legal status of legal title. So the seller in a 1031 exchange is the legal owner and is the buyer in a 1031 exchange. They must be the same. So when this kind of comes into play is you'll often see properties are held in LLCs. Well, I need to know whether that LLC is regarded in the eyes of the federal government or is it disregarded in the eyes of the federal government. I also want to know if it's in a partnership, right? So a lot of these things come into play. Vesting doesn't always mean how they own title. We may have an LLC in a community property state, such as Washington, with a husband and wife as the members of the LLC, but because we're community property state, that LLC will be regarded as, as being disregarded in, in the eyes of the Fed. So you see, it kind of gets complicated. So I always ask, how do you own the property? Individual, I'm going to say fine. If it's a trust, an LLC, or partnership, I'm going to ask more questions and for the sake of this morning, we're not allowed to go any deeper than that. But there's lots of questions to ask. So here's kind of the, the bottom line in a 1031 exchange. What are the requirements for full deferral? Well, number one, it will be to reinvest their net equity proceeds. I say net equity proceeds. So there's a sales proceeds minus cost of sale transactional items equals their net equity proceed. Transactional items that can be expensed through their sales proceeds according to the code are real estate commissions, title and escrow fees, recording fees, transfer taxes, and our fee in the exchange. So number one, for full deferral, reinvest net equity proceeds. Number two, take on same or greater debt. This comes as a surprise to many investors. I think they forget. So the government looks at the 1031 exchange as the continuity of investment. So with that, if you are paying off a mortgage on the sale of your property, then the government says for 100% full deferral on all those capital gain taxes that we looked at a minute ago, you must take on same or greater debt in the new property or properties. Now the third bullet, we have something called boot. Funny name. Boot means non-like kind to the 1031 exchange. Boot generally comes in two forms in a 1031. The first form is called cash boot. If your clients sell their property for $1.5 million and decide to take $500,000 out of the closing, meaning they just want the $500,000 to use whatever they can, but then they will be taxed on whatever they take out of the exchange because it's non-like kind. They also may have cash remaining in their exchange fund. Let's say it's $500,000. They spent a million on a replacement property, but they still have $500,000 left in their exchange account. Well, the Treasury regulations say that is considered non-like kind and therefore is taxable. 
So the second form of boot is called mortgage boot. The Treasury regulations actually call it debt relief. Debt relief. Hard to understand. Basically, it means if the taxpayer in an exchange takes on new debt in the property, but it is less than what he paid off on his selling property, that difference is called mortgage boot and therefore is subject to capital gain taxation. What all this means is that boot is taxable. I have here any consideration that is non-real estate. So oftentimes I'll, I'll find with some commercial deals, uh, I, I've seen um, exotic cars be part of uh, the purchase and sale agreement. So whatever the value of that item, that would be considered boot and is taxable. So when you have boot and you're still doing a 1031 exchange, it's now called a partial exchange. And we're seeing a lot of them today because of the high appreciation that investors are experiencing. There's some strategies for excess cash in the exchange account. One of them is called the Vacation Home Exchange. So I want you to listen up. This is a phenomenal opportunity. So let's say your clients have $500,000 left in their exchange account. They could identify a property. Let's say they like the sun. They can identify a property in Scottsdale, Arizona. Let's say it's a condominium. So they use that $500,000 to do an exchange into a condominium in Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay, I'm going to give you three rules of two. Very simple. It's an opportunity for your clients to ultimately either have a second home or a dream home with their gross, well, their sales proceeds from their exchange. First rule, there are three rules of two. First one, the client must hold the property for two years. Second rule, the client must rent the property for a minimum of 14 days per year. Minimum rental time, 14 days per year. Third and last rule, the client must limit their personal use of the property to 14 days per year or 10% of the time it's rented, whichever is greater. Now I know what you're thinking, well, I, I can't, I want to use my property more than two weeks. Okay, I'm just telling you what the rules say. So if you have a long-term rental, say someone lives in that property for 200 days, well then you were able to use it for 20 days. But here is the opportunity. After two years, the IRS recognizes that investors change their intent and now you have a second home or you have a dream home that you move into. It's a wonderful opportunity to use boot or to simply exchange into. Okay, the second one are called DSTs. <clears throat> it actually stands for Delaware Statutory Trust. And Derek, I believe you are going to address this a little bit further. They are actually... Oh, you okay, good. Yeah, I thought you were. So a DST, yes. Delaware Statutory Trust, is actually a fractional ownership in a much larger institutional commercial grade product. And Derek, would you cover the last three points here on Inland and Blue Rock? Absolutely. Uh, uh, the, uh, the DST, the Delaware Statutory Trust that Anna Marie is discussing, uh, really the key to it is you're buying it through a financial institution. So it's a uh, security in which you can acquire an interest and you can 1031 into and you don't fall into the same rules as if you were going to try to use the proceeds to buy uh, a REIT stock, which you can't 1031 into. You can only up REIT, as Anna Marie discussed earlier. So with the DST, you buy it through your financial advisor. There's three that I've come across that, uh, that come highly recommended, uh, Inland Private Capital Corp, um, Blue Rock, 
and AEI Capital Corporation. And what they do is they go out, they find properties across the country that they can acquire, they put them, and you basically are buying into that individual asset. So it's like doing a 1031 or exchanging into another property because you know the property, you know where it is, you can touch it, um, you can see it, and it's not a pool, it's an individual asset. Uh, and you own an interest in that. And the same thing, as was mentioned earlier, is that you still have to have the debt covenants covered and you still have to recognize all the proceeds have to be. So these are good for fillers. As uh, Henri was discussing, if you have an identified property you want and you got a couple hundred thousand dollars left in your account, then you can identify, you go through and identify these in the process of doing your identification period, which Henri is going to talk about and uh, this would just be one of the ones you identify. So you don't have to go through with it, but it's a good filler and a stop gap uh, if you look to choose and look into it. But there's a lot to these, so uh, if you want more information, more than happy to talk to you about them, but yeah, DST is a great uh, filler or an opportunity if you just want to get out of management altogether and you just want to get a preferred return of five to 7% and, uh, and move on. So uh, that's all I got. Thanks, Henri. All right, thank you, Derek. And what Derek said, yes, this is a DSC is a good investment vehicle. If you have clients that are in the sunset of their real estate investment career, if they're you know they've been doing it 30, 25, 40 years, they're they're tired of it. Here's a way for them to defer the capital gains on their highly appreciated property and defer into a DST. The, DST, again, the Delaware Statutory Trust, are sold through the financial institution. They look at it as a security instrument. However, the IRS says they are applicable to be a replacement property for uh, 1031 exchange. I'm doing a lot of them. Month over month, I do more and more. Also, another use for it is to use as one of your identification properties. Because what's happening due to market conditions being fast and furious and low inventory is that what if your client identifies properties and they don't win the offer? Well, now they're stuck. They may not have an exchange. So if you use this, it's kind of like your last stop catch-all in case the other identified properties um, are not won through an offer. Okay, so what are the requirements that the IRS is concerned about on a 1031 exchange? Well, number one are time requirements. I'm, for those of you who have done them, you know them, but the IRS looks at this very, very carefully. So the total exchange period for a client to close on their replacement property or properties is a total of 180 calendar days or the date the taxpayer must file its tax return, which includes extensions, for the year of the transfer of the selling property, whichever is first. So a total of 180 calendar days, that means weekends and holidays, of which the identification period is included in that. So of the 180 calendar days, the first 45 days are called the identification period. And this is where the taxpayer must identify their replace, excuse me, potential replacement properties by midnight of the 45th day. And there are some rules with that identification. The rules are there are three different ways to identify um, the replacement properties. The taxpayer has to tell the IRS on a form, which rule they're using. For the sake of time this morning, I am just going to cover one rule because this is a rule that over 90% of exchanges in the United States is used. doesn't matter whether they're commercial or residential. And that is called the three property rule. So the taxpayer who's in an exchange, they need to identify within the first 45 days uses the three property rule. Three property rule says you may identify three properties regardless of their fair market value. So let's say on day 20, your client identifies properties A, B, and C. Then on day 37, they see properties D and E. All they need to do is revoke the prior 
properties identified, let's say they rebook properties B and C, and replace them with properties D and E. Now, I am going to tell you, it says here, the identif identification requires a wet signature. So for those of you who say, what is a wet signature? That's your handwriting, right? Your John Hancock signature on the form or the email. So if your clients have real estate agents or brokers identifying property for them, they send the address over in an email, the client goes online, looks at them and says, yes, that's fine, they cannot send that to us just like that. They will need to print that email with those addresses and physically sign that printed email, then scan it and send it to us. So also, who do they send their identification to? The exchanger sends their identification to whom? Well, according to the Treasury regulations, it says someone who is not a disqualified party to the exchange. So not to go into the uh, dry explanation of a disqualified party, let me tell you this. Your client should identify with their exchange counselor, bottom line. Do not have them send it to escrow or the closing agent, they're just going to print it and put it in their file. It is not their job. The exchange counselor is going to make sure that the identification is done correctly. It sounds simple, but this is where most of the errors occur in a 1031 exchange. And when the IRS comes to question, you better have an open wallet because it's going to cost you some money. Okay. Here's something that's very common because we have so many properties that are, lit, are you know, they're listed as an LLC or a partnership. Well, what do you do when you've got that highly appreciated property? And let's say there's three partners. And one of the partners doesn't want to go forward with an exchange. They just want to be cashed out and pay their taxes. Well, what are you going to do? Well, there are a couple of ways to do this. Let me tell you that the partnership is the owner of the capital asset. The partners merely have partnership interests. And the IRS defines those interests as personal property. And partnership interests are specifically excluded from Section 1031. So what must happen? Well, the partnership needs to change. If a partner, if, excuse me, um, so if the partnership sells, does an exchange, and gives money to the exiting partner who wants to be cashed out, that partnership will incur what we call boot, and that's going to be taxable. So what can they do? Well, they need to convert the partnership interest into an interest into the real estate. So how do they do that? The most common way is number one, drop and swap. So the partnership or LLC, they must be liquidated. And they will drop down, so that means checking accounts, you know, whatever other things. So the owners of the partnership will drop down into tenant in common co-owners, and if they wish, they can uh, form a single-member LLC. Now, everybody who was a partner now has a percentage of ownership in the real estate, and now they can go forward with selling the property and, and perhaps doing an exchange. Do you know you see here another bullet? It says holding issue. So in a drop and a swap, the drop is the drop down into tenant and common co-owners, and the swap is the exchange. Well, the holding issue is, is paramount, even though the Treasury regulations do not tell us how long to hold real estate property, investment property, nowhere. In the Treasury regulations, as it states, how long to hold. 
What the IRS looks at is intent. So your client, right, they had a, a broker, uh, listed their property, it's under ABC partnership, they've got an offer, now they're in escrow, and they find out from their tax advisor that, that the partnership either has to go forward with the exchange or everybody pays capital gains, right? So they perform a drop and a swap. This usually happens in escrow. Now they've sold, they've done their exchange. What the IRS can do is come back and say, how long did you hold your property in the new owner profile, meaning the tenant and common co-owners? It's happening in escrow. It's only going to be a couple months, right? That's a short-term hold. Even though the IRS doesn't tell us, the IRS can come back and say, you know, when you performed a drop and a swap, your intent was to sell, and as owners of the tenant in common profile, you haven't held the property long enough for investment or long-term capital gain treatment. So there's a risk there. I will tell you, 90% of drop and swaps occur in escrow. That is up to the investor, who I call the taxpayer, and their tax advisor or their legal counsel. It is not my job. There is risk associated with it. It's up to the investor. I had a large uh, commercial transaction. I was called on a Thursday afternoon. The property was closing on Friday, and the client told me, we're closing tomorrow, and we're going to perform a drop and a swap. We're working on the paperwork tonight. I informed the client of the risks associated with that and what the Treasury regulations uh, say. He was well aware of that if he was going to handle the risk. So what you need to know is on the like-kind exchange IRS form 8824, the third question is, the date you acquired the property. Fourth question, the date you sold the property. So under new ownership as tenant and common co-owners, it would be that date. Okay, going on, there is one structure called a PIN. It's a, it's a partnership installment note. So this is an alternative for that exiting partner or partners, so the partnership, partnership avoids paying boot. So in a PIN transaction, instead of receiving cash, the partnership actually receives an installment note in the amount necessary to cash out the departing partners or partner. So the note is then transferred as part of a consideration for the partnership interest, and when one payment is made under the note, usually at closing, and then the next payment is usually the following tax year, then the gain associated with the note will be taxed under that Section 453 installment sale that we covered at the beginning. So it's, it's a planning opportunity. It's very complicated. So if you have, since you, now you know about the PAN, I've explained it very briefly. It does require uh, sophisticated tax ad advisors and legal counsel on it. So moving forward, Another area that the IRS is concerned with is related parties. Why would that matter? Well, let's first define who is a related party. Well, the easy answer is any lineal descendant. Okay, so follow the blood. So a family member is a related party, right? Brother, sister, mother, father, not aunts or uncles or cousins or step-parents or step-children. That's the easy answer on the related party. But there's also individuals and corporations that own 50% of the stock in another corporation which owns property. So you look at S-Corps or any other corporation if the same person owns more than 50% of that real estate. The reason why the IRS is concerned with related party exchanges is for basis shifting, right? Because your basis carries forward with you in an exchange. So you sell a low basis for a high basis. 
And the other reason why uh, the IRS is concerned with related party exchanges is because that related party is receiving cash, essentially cashing out. So the IRS looks at that related party issue as one economic unit. Now, there are ways to do related party exchanges. Um, I'm just going to go through uh, a couple of them very quickly. If your client is selling, is selling and doing an exchange, they may sell to a related party. There's a stipulation that both parties must hold onto their respective properties for a minimum of two years. So if uh, your client sells to one of their adult children, they got a, that adult child must hold that property for two years. If that adult child sells the property at 100, you know, 360 days, instead of holding it for 365 days, that will blow up uh, the exchange. The IRS will come back. Another way, um, many people want to purchase from a related party. So it doesn't have to be just family members. It can be corporations, right? They've got subsidiaries, that, but remember, there's a 50% rule here. So you cannot sell, uh, you cannot purchase as a replacement property from a related party. That is an absolute no. And then to make things just a little more confusing, the third way is, is that all related parties who are selling and buying, performing their own separate exchanges, they may uh, purchase from a related party if they're also doing a standalone exchange themselves. So that's confusing, isn't it? Sorry. Just remember, if it's a family member or an entity that owns 50% or more, there are some rules, and there's only a couple ways to do an exchange with related parties. Okay, let's talk about replacement properties. You know, so we're all aware that in today's environment, it's a challenge to find a replacement property. Whether you're in the residential market or the commercial market or in another marketplace, the market inventory is low. So one of the things that's an option for your clients is to perform a parking arrangement, a parking exchange. And we have actually asset preservation, you know, we're a national exchange company, year over year, month over month, since January 2014, have had a huge increase in these parking arrangement exchanges. So let me just define them uh, a little bit here for you. What is a parking exchange? Well, basically, it means that the qualified intermediary, the exchange company, is parking title of the property of the investors. And there's a couple ways to do that. So the first one is um, called a reverse exchange. So your client, and this happens, this has very, been very popular, they find the replacement property first. They find it. They see it. Perfect location. Perfect size. Maybe it's not even listed. They heard about it from somebody. They must seize the opportunity and purchase the replacement property first before selling their relinquished property. Very popular uh, option in today's market. We also, so why they purchase the reverse, we have to hold title, right? Because you cannot uh, own the replacement property and the selling property at the same time according to the Treasury regulations. The improvement exchange um, is popular because let's say your clients have about $2 million in exchange funds, <clears throat> excuse me, they buy the property, that's um, a little bit of a derelict, you know, it's had some deferred maintenance, but it's in an upcoming area. And the purchase price is less. So they purchased for $1.7. Now they have $300,000 to make some improvements to the property to bring it up to market grade where they can command market rental rates. I'm not saying that all the improvements are $300,000. 
I'm just saying that they can make their improvements during the exchange period and use the remaining exchange funds. Maybe their improvements are half a million, but they have 300 in their exchange funds, so let's use it up. That's what an improvement exchange, um, parking exchange is. And then lastly, the you know, reverse improvement. You'll see these when you've been driving around. You'll see build a suit. Uh, this is where the exchanger will purchase land and then start, start doing some site preparation on the land they purchased with the remaining funds. So it's a little bit tricky, complicated, but just know that there are options uh, there for your clients. So one of the prevailing thoughts on why reverses have been popular is because you buy at today's price and you sell it tomorrow. Now that was quite the thing in, in 2016. We've seen a little bit of some uh, price depression uh, this year, depending on uh, which marketplace you're in. So there, there is that, uh, that kind of that philosophy that, well, I'll buy at today's price and I'll sell my relinquished property at tomorrow's price, which in theory is higher. Obviously, selling, uh, securing the replacement property first allows the client who, who may have multiple properties, right? So they put their multiple properties on the market and see which one sells first. That way it kind of takes that pressure off of that 45 days of identifying. They found their property, they found their replacement, they purchased it, we're holding title and waiting for them to sell one of their uh, multiple relinquished properties on the market. So we kind of covered this uh, before, the strategy for boot. Again, boot will come into play with parking arrangements as well. And so the strategies are, remember the vacation home, it's an opportunity to put a down payment on a vacation home condo and then potentially in two years make it a second home or just to have his rental income as well. We've talked about the Delaware Statutory Trust, that fractional ownership in a institutional commercial grade product. We have the TIC, the tenant in common. Um, that is still a viable product today. It has some different uh, twists and turns to it. There's a limited number of investors. The investors are um, have some obligation to the debt. So, but they're still very viable. And I just want to say one thing for you on the 50% ship ownership rule. I want to cover one more scenario for you. I often get this. I get a call. I'm performing an exchange, I want to use my cash proceeds and buy out my buy out my partner, and they're not in a partnership, they just own 50-50 co-owners, tenant in common, let's say in a rental house. They said, can I use my funds? I said, no, you own 50%. So it's a strategy that people often think of, or they bought some land a while ago, now they want to use their exchange funds and build on the land they own. Well, they obviously own more than 50%. So that's just something to keep in mind. Some other creative uh, replacement parts, uh, replacement properties, that's what REP stands for. You know, it really leads to, diversica to diversification. So in the 90s, cell easements were being created. You know, all the cell companies were popping up their towers. And, and they were quite popular, well, they're back. They're back because all of us, many of you, are listening or watching this today on your phone, on that little phone that, you, that we do everything on. We check the weather, you know, we check our calendar. So now the cell companies are coming back and they're looking for areas to put more towers because they need more, more bandwidth. And then, you know, one puts a tower up and the others put their dishes on it and rent it. So if you have a client who's got some land on their property, you know, has got an area, they can very well create a perpetual easement for a cell tower. So that would create an income opportunity, and it also creates an opportunity to sell it and perform a 1031 exchange. We also have conservation easements have become um, kind of higher, higher mind or top of mind, I should say. There's a number of areas that people have properties that abut to uh, public properties that have view potentials. 
So we're finding that they're creating a conservation easement. And what happens? It's usually a public entity or a land trust that will come and purchase those. So there's lots of things out there. Uh, we've got the DST. Um, again, as Derek just mentioned to you, the debt is matched with the offering, and then we have that vacation home. So that's a really uh, quick-paced, high-level uh, you know, coverage this morning on replacement properties, you know, with a regular delayed exchange or parking arrangement, and then some of the various others. So, I'm often asked, how much is it 1031? What are your fees? Well, I'm going to say in one word, we're probably the least fee in the whole transaction. So, when people start asking me about fees, I tell them, at Asset Preservation, we have a flat $1,000. I don't, it doesn't matter whether you're selling a $50 million building or a $500,000 rental. We charge $1,000 on a regular delayed exchange, and you may purchase up to three replacement properties with us. But a more important question is, is your security of funds? A lot of exchangers don't talk about that. They don't even ask, and it drives me crazy because it's the most paramount item they should be asking when they're talking to an exchange company. I want you to know that exchange companies are not federally regulated. We have no federal oversight. There are only four national exchange companies. Asset preservation is one of four, and the rest are independents. So there's some very good independents, and there's some, you know, otherwise independents. So the foremost important thing is how are your funds held, right? Does your exchange company have errors in admission? Do they have a fidelity bond? But I want I'm going to give you a footnote on the Fidelity bond. If the exchange company has a, has a $10 million Fidelity bond, you know, large exchange companies, we hold hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of exchange fund on any given month. So a $10 million bond doesn't go very far. We offer something else at, at, in addition to that at asset preservation called a letter of assurance. Uh, which only two companies in the nation offer, and we're one of them. But I digress. So they really need to find out where are they being held. And the National Qualified Intermediary Exchange Companies, we can only hold them in A or better rated banks, right? You don't want to be a big depositor in a small bank. Your clients need to ask what kind of account are they being held in. So, with the national companies, we hold them in a separate, segregated account with their tax ID number. Some of the smaller independent companies will commingle exchangers' proceeds, so just so they're just in one fund. Also, what are the requirements to withdraw exchange proceeds? Seems like oh, okay, she's mentioning that, but that's important, right? You know, if they um, if the exchange company is authorized to move the funds without your client's written signature, that is a red flag. All right. And, you know, what kind of third-party guarantees are there? The four nationals, we are all owned by large national um, title companies, so we have this huge backing from our current company. So, again, today we covered uh, the two types of exchanges. Delayed exchange, which is you sell and you buy, and there's rules in the middle. The parking arrangement exchanges, those were the reverse, the improvement, and the reverse improvement. So going on, seller financing. Most people do not realize that the client can use their note, if they've done some seller financing to the buyer of their property, in their exchange. So, if it, I'll drop down to the out. So, if the seller decides not to put their installment note in the exchange, then the seller receives their uh, payment 
on that note under the installment sale accounting treatment of section 453. But if, what if they want to include it? Well, four thing, one of four things must be done. If your client wants to include their seller financing in an exchange, the note must be liquidated. And there are four ways to do that, and I'll cover those quickly. Number one, the note is paid off within the exchange period. Perhaps it was a short-term note. Number two, the taxpayer or somebody close to the taxpayer purchases the note themselves. So that client will receive the income stream from the note. The cash goes, gets added to your client's exchange funds. Number three, perhaps they can use the note as cash in the replacement property. Maybe that seller of their replacement property will take their note as cash, right? Because now we have a reduction in price, but we still have uh, more, meaning the exchange funds are a higher percentage of the, of the purchase price. And then lastly, the note is sold on the secondary market. However, these are usually discounted anywhere from 15 to 35 percent. I mean, keep in mind if it's a new note, it's unseasoned, so that's one of the reasons why uh, the note is discount. So again, your clients can put the note in the exchange. They must do four things. Also, I want to mention that the exchange company becomes the beneficiary um, of the note during the exchange period. So you, you want to know your exchange company, right? You want to know that they have the, the financial wherewithal. All right, and so at this portion of today, I'm going to hand this over to Derek, who's going to go through some due diligence items with you. I want to thank you for this opportunity. Derek? Thanks, Anna Marie. Uh, go ahead and advance to the next slide. Perfect. Uh, now that we've got a big understanding of 1031s, or at least a broad stroke of it, I mean, the first call you got to make is the Anna Marie to make sure you got the right team in place uh, and put yourself in a position to take advantage of the rules and regulations that are out there. And uh, that's that's key. I, a team is very important in anything that you do, uh, whether it's choosing a broker, your CPA, your attorney, uh, your uh, escrow company, title company. Um, I mean, you want to make sure your whole team is together. Uh, in place as you go and look at this and as you if you're uh, out there and you're helping your clients look at opportunities uh, as Anna Marie expressed out there I mean it's extremely important I mean from a cost perspective I mean a thousand dollars I mean that's, it is a drop in the bucket in any deal that that kind of knowledge on the phone uh, and to be a part of uh, what you're trying to accomplish uh, what I want to talk about is now that you're getting your mind thought about the disposition side of your asset and what to do with the proceeds my role and what I look to do is to maximize that disposition value of your asset. So where I step in is I step in to help clients look at how do you maximize the return that I've worked so hard to build this asset and groom this asset to get it ready. And so I want to give a quick overview of kind of how you can maximize that. So first off, you got to get the property ready for sale. Make sure all those leases are secured. Make sure all the renewals are negotiated. Uh, nothing worse than getting forced into a retrade because they start to do diligence, due diligence and see that your leases are expiring in eight months and you haven't addressed that. So address all the potential gotchas up front and get it ready for sale. Um, deferred maintenance, absolutely get that deferred maintenance done. If that roof needs to be done, look at getting it done because they're going to hammer on you. When I say they, those are the buyers. They're going to hammer on you to figure out any way to get that value down, no matter where the location is in the hottest markets or the worst markets. They're going to fire it down at you and try to get that price down. You know, dress for success, I like to call it, that street appeal. You know, take care of it. Make sure that it's ready to go. Um, don't get lazy and tired towards the end of the transaction, that's when you step up your game and you start pushing it and making sure that street appeal looks good. Everything together, no alligator in the parking lot, you know, all the things you want to have, make sure those are done. And then you're going to choose your broker. So identifying a broker to work with. I recommend you work with someone who doesn't have a dual agency relationship, meaning don't work with someone who says, I've got five buyers in my back pocket and I'll bring one of them to you. You want to get that property on the market. So you want a broker that's going to do just disposition only. They're going to focus on getting the highest price. Only concern they have is maximize the value of your property. Make sure they have a proven success track record in that marketplace. 
So they understand the asset class, they understand the market, and they have a good network and relationships that are out there that will help drive that value. But again, back to you, make sure you're going to list it because off-market deals will sell for the majority of the time less than what it would be if they're listing in competition. You want to create competition. Make sure they understand your objectives and goals. So when you sit down, you have that conversation with your broker and say, we're looking to do a 1031 transaction and we're looking to work with you just on disposition. We want you to be focused on my disposition, not focus on helping us find replacement properties. We have other groups we're going to talk to about that. I want you to be the assassin to go out there and make this transaction be the biggest that we could potentially get. So if they're not in line with you, make sure you shop around and look for that right person. Um, make sure they have a, a proven and well you know, laid out strategy. So they've showed you how they make things work. And then ask them, where did they fail? What marketing strategies didn't work? What, what all have you tried? Um, so really understand, make sure you're in the same alignment. And then what does a successful listing strategy look like? Make sure they have an enhanced marketing strategy. That isn't picking up the phone and calling the last five people that bought from you and say, here's the things that, uh, that we're looking for. No, it's actually putting together a, an enhanced marketing plan, which means you're using every tool possible. You're on the web. You're, you're uh, doing mailers. You're picking up the phone and making cold calls. Make sure that person has that kind of strategy. Make sure they're giving you access to the unknown buyers. That's who's going to pay you the most. I don't know how many transactions I've done where it's always the unknown buyer that comes in from out of town that picks up the property. They pay a lot more than the local buyer was going to buy because they thought they were the only game in town. So make sure you have that group or that strategy that really finds that unknown buyer. Uh, embrace technology, not just a good old boy network like I discussed earlier. I mean, they have to use technology. You've got to get the word out there, whether it's overseas or here in the United States. You want that to get as much exposure. And more exposure is a good thing. Has a mass marketing machine. Exposure is everything. So that means they're blasting it. You're getting hundreds of thousands of listings pushed out every day. You're getting your, your name, your brand, meaning the property itself is being promoted. And it has a great website created for it. Has all the tools, has a vault system. So it allows you to have all the due diligence items already in place. So a good broker, that's what they'll do. They'll have everything ready to go for you. So when those buyers come in, they can't retrade you. They see everything there. And you got basically a feeding frenzy to come in and bid on it. So you're creating the market for your opportunity and putting your property not on the market but in the market. So at the end of the day, they've got to be able to create that market and the feeding frenzy to buy your property. And they must have the knowledge and ability to negotiate the right deal. So again, not somebody who's counting the commission, not somebody who's trying to come in and just slam a deal done in the next 30 days. You want the person that can be on your side negotiating the best deal possible and fighting for you because you've worked very hard and your clients have worked very hard to build these assets and hold these assets and they want to basically move into the next phase of their lives with the most money possible from the transaction sale. So, I mean, that is truly how you maximize the disposition value of your real estate investment. So between maximizing your investment, having a great strategy with Anna Marie of looking at a 1031 transaction, working with your CPA, your attorney, your whole team, this will be an easy, fun process and a lucrative one. So with that, Anna, that's all I've got for that slide. All right. Well, here we are at the conclusion and final comment, so I'm going to let you lead off with that, Derek. Yeah, well, I mean, when we talked about the 1031 recap, I mean, every time I hear the presentation, it's, uh, you know, it's amazing how much your company does and your firm does for, you know, for that fee. I mean, it's just, it, you know, asset preservation is key, not only as a company, but as a term itself as the, the, the clients know. So, um, you know, the, the 1031 exchanges have been around for a very long time. My prior life as a public accountant and working in tax, I did a lot of them on the tax side of it and tax strategies, but it, it amazes me how much uh, work you and your team put in there to make sure your clients are taken care of. And something you mentioned earlier around who holds the money, that's very key. Uh, some people may not recall, uh, some years back, there was actually a group who started doing the uh, 1031 uh, escrow funds and they had an embezzlement issue and there was major lawsuits that fell out of that. So there's, you've got to make sure you're with a group and with somebody who can uh, take care of that and you can rest at night. And that's definitely one of the things your firm is well known for. And Stuart Title, I mean, Stuart Title does a great job on the title work that I work on. So I appreciate that. But the, uh, all the strategies that are out there, uh, it's important that you explore them all. And, uh, and then you also uh, look at what's going to fit in with your personal goals and the entity's goals if it's necessary to do the exchange. Um, 
and then maximizing the property value we just talked about. You know, get your property ready. Choose the right broker. Don't just choose your your brother-in-law or somebody who's a family member. Choose the one who's going to maximize the value of your property, and then create your market. Don't let the market dictate what you're going to do. Make sure you create your own market. So, uh, with that, any questions that anybody may have, please reach out to Anna Marie. Uh, you know, regarding any 1031 strategies or anything to do with the, the escrow side of it. And if you have any questions on disposition, you know, I'm I'm here. I'd love to talk to you. And I uh, look forward to helping everybody that we possibly can. So I'd like to thank everybody for their time today. And uh, thank you, Anna Marie, for participating. Uh, great presentation. And uh, that's all thank I've you. got. Well, all right, well, thank you, Derek. Thank you, everyone. You know, I am just a phone call away. You never know where I am. I could be in Spokane. I could be in Belle Bellevue. I could be in Portland. I could be in Bend, Oregon. So please use my uh, toll-free number. It rings to my cell phone if I'm not in my office. Or ask your question to me via email. Um, I'm here to answer your questions. I know the Treasury regulations with 1031, and I look forward to hearing from you. Well, I'd like to thank you both on behalf of Anna Marie, Derek, <clears throat> Asset Preservation Incorporated, Barclays Realty and Management. <clears throat> I'd like to thank you all for your participation today in today's Industry Expert Insights powered by DerekDoke.com. Have a great day.